Hi, my name is Father Alex Godey. I am the associate pastor here at St. Genevieve, ordained two years ago. This is my second assignment. Last year I was assigned to St. Francis de Sales Cathedral. And one of my big passions is to connect people with the patrimony of the Catholic Church that has always been available to them, but they just, they just don't know about it. So, let's begin. That was, that was by way of the simple introduction. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments to walk through the next few days. And what that, what that means is the next few days is the celebration of the Triduum, three days leading up to Easter, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Saturday, and then your, your own celebration on Easter Sunday whenever you would do that, okay? We will gather as best we can on each day of the week and each day of the week. Whatever you can come to, come to. Whatever you can't come to will be available to you online on YouTube. I don't know exactly how that's gonna work at the moment because I've only ever posted one video to YouTube and uh, I've always been able to connect with the people who were supposed to be at that event through a Facebook event. So I'll try my best to get a hold of everybody, let everybody know how to get a hold of this through what's available on YouTube. It'll probably be Rest in Me on YouTube. I don't know how many other titles there are like that though. Okay, tomorrow is Holy Thursday. Um, my desire this week is what, what, I, what I feel is most important. Like this is not what is the most important. What is the most important is for you to be able to enter into the Holy Week services in the way that helps you the best. So my hope and my expectation would be that you would make it a priority to go to your church's celebrations during Holy Week. So. At our parish here at St. Genevieve, Thursday night we have Mass at 6, which is the Mass of the Lord's Supper. On Friday at 3, we have our solemn service. And on Saturday at 8, we have the Easter Vigil. And those would be the three main portions of the liturgy for this year. Seeing that this helps us to see the Triduum itself as the yearly retreat that the church gives us to reflect on the death, resurrection, suffering of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. So, if you can, which you, everybody here can't, but if you could, I would highly advise you to go to the Chrism Mass tomorrow at 1030. Um, <clears throat> unless you just skip school, that's not going to happen, and that's fine. Uh, uh, and if anybody meets me there, um, my desire would be to go out to lunch afterwards, but I, I know that you guys won't be available for that. Okay, that being the case. Um, Thursday, the, the other thing for us would be a 3 p.m. conference. So just like we started, we're, we're not really starting. We haven't really started the content yet. Um, tomorrow, we will not, if you show up at 3.15, you will not have missed any new content. Uh, I'll be you know, shaking hands and saying hi and catching up with everybody. Uh, so if you show up for, th for 3.15, you won't, you won't have missed anything. Now, Good Friday. Good Friday, you are free. So, you have two options on Good Friday. Uh, or, actually, you have three options. The third option is, or you do whatever else you think is going to help you. The first option is, um, we have a 10 a.m. conference here in this room um, that will cover different, uh, that will be new material. Okay? Or, you go to the Hike for Christ at Christ the Redeemer. This is an all-day streetway of the cross that starts at Christ the Redeemer and goes to all the churches in the city of Thibodeau. It's a very powerful experience. And if you've never been, go to that. And for those who either don't want to wake up for 10 because it's the first day you've been able to sleep in all year, no judgment, I understand what that feels like, and you don't want to go to the hike for Christ, or if you're going to the hike for Christ, you certainly can't be here for the 10 o'clock class. I'm repeating the same class at 6 p.m. on Good Friday. Now, here's what that does not mean. It's not two different classes. So if you show up to both, you're going to be very disappointed at the second one. It is, it is going to be the same topic, okay? Um, most churches have their um, Good Friday service at 3 o'clock on Friday. Christ the Redeemer doesn't. They have theirs after the hike for Christ completes. So um, my encouragement is, again, is to participate as best you can in the actual Triduum services before you focus. Because this you can listen to on YouTube at, at your leisure. 
but you, you can't just leave here willy-nilly whenever you want and go to the Good Friday service. It's, it's not going to happen. You're only allowed to do one service, and it's supposed to be at 3 p.m. So, On Holy Saturday, we will have two different conferences because Holy Saturday is quiet. Generally, from 3 o'clock on Friday until about eight, 6 to 8 o'clock on Saturday, there is a big gap of silence. Now, that's intentional because Jesus Christ is in the tomb. So what that means is that gives us a little more time that day for more conferences. So we're going to have a, sec a, a conference at 9 a.m. on the Saturday, and then a second conference at 3 p.m. on the Saturday. The 3 p.m. conference will be a little different in that it's going to be more practical, and it's going to be more of our sharing our experiences. If we lived in a perfect world, we would gather again on Sunday or Monday to have that talk. You know, what did you experience? I wouldn't say anything. You just guys would just share. But I don't want to take you away from your families on Monday. And I want to rest on Monday. So I'm not going to be available Monday uh, to meet. And that's why we're not going to meet. Okay. So we're trying to accomplish that Saturday evening. Um, all of our conferences will be here. Um, my expectation for us for the next three days is that we would experience as much prayer and silence as possible. Now, for me, that is not impossible, but very close to impossible because I have, I have to, I'm in charge of the server practices and I'm in charge of uh, getting this, I have to get this ready and then I have to participate in the liturgies and there's only so much silence I'll be able to have. And you guys certainly will only be able to have so much silence tomorrow. I mean, you have to go to work. But rest assured, the early Christians, they had to go to work too. Even on Good Friday. So, the expectation is, but even though you can't have silence all day, my suggestion is to have as much as you can. That means um, suppress the temptation to go and talk with your coworkers in between classes. Maybe take lunch in your classroom instead of, uh, instead of where you ordinarily would so that you can have that silence throughout the day. Then certainly Friday and Saturday you can have as much silence as available to you. Do not abandon your families. Be nice to them. But um, maybe let them know tonight that, hey, I'm, I'm going to try and do something different. Uh, my other expectation is that we would get at least 30 minutes of prayer time in. Um, on each of the days, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, that's what the whole last two pages of your handout are about. Also, uh, know that after the conferences, maybe not tonight because it's gonna be dark, um, but the grounds of St. Genevieve are totally available to you. You can leave here, go to wherever church you want, um, or, or wherever you want to go. Whatever is gonna facilitate your ability to be quiet and to pray is where is what you is what I want you to do. Okay. So those are the expectations and the schedules. Um, my suggestion for other activities besides that, um, we're going to get into why you don't want to do too, too much, but one or two other things might be helpful. What I did my whole life growing up was Good Friday, we, walked, we, went, we went, well, I grew up at Christ the Redeemer, so Good Friday, we would do the hike for Christ. I would go to the solemn service because I was crazy, um, and then I would watch all start to finish of the Ten Commandments. It was a very busy Friday. <laughs> um, now we have an even better blessing because the passion of the Christ has been produced. And so what I've done since that movie came out on DVD is I each day before the liturgy and after the liturgy, I watch that movie up to the point of the liturgy and then after the liturgy, watch after that liturgy up until the end of the day. So on Holy Thursday, I watched the movie until the Last Supper, which is a flashback or something. Then I go to the Mass of the Lord's Supper and then watch the movie after the 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 Lord after the uh, the Last Supper, all the way to uh, Jesus's arrest, his trial is not trial, but trial before the Sanhedrin, uh, and then whenever night falls and the next day dawns, um, I stop the movie, and then on Good Friday I go up to the beginning of the Passion. And then uh, I stop at a certain point, and then after the Good Friday service, I continue on. So I watch the movie in, you know, 15 to 30 minute chunks, based on what is going to happen, as a way to help me reflect. 
I highly suggest um, picking one of the gospel accounts of the Passion, uh, probably Matthew's, because that's the one where, where we, we read this past Sunday, or John's, because that's what we're going to read on Good Friday. And read it very slowly, but also read it sequentially up until the the feet, until the the the, the supper the uh, the liturgy. So read it up to the to the uh, the Last Supper, and then read after the Last Supper to the end of the night and things like that. Okay, so those are my suggestions. Um, here's what a conference is going to look like. We will uh, gather on the hour. Um, and have about 15 minutes to, uh, my hope is to share what's happened since the previous time we've met. What was your experience of prayer like? This allows us to encourage each other so that one person who might be sitting there going like, I'm not getting anything, could be encouraged by those who are sitting there going, I'm not getting anything either. Or those who are really getting something profound that can, can, can know that like, I'm not crazy. This is, this is more than just me in my head. And, and those who are struggling can be encouraged by those who are not struggling. And those who are not struggling can uh, be humbled by those who are. That God is speaking to me and this other person is really struggling through this. And to see how blessed and be thankful for that. Um, then we'll have about a 30-minute talk that will encompass all of the new material and suggestions for what you might pray about over the next day. And then we'll conclude with about 15 minutes um, for discussion or for questions. So you notice that on the handout, this is not my, my prettiest handout, um, there is a, a rather lengthy left margin, um, right margin. And the whole point of that is that gives you space to write on. And that writing is very is very powerful. You know, for me, it keeps me focused because I'm super ADD all the time. Uh, but it also gives you a place to say, this is where I feel moved. And, and we'll get to why that's important later on. But um, that'll give you a, 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 a readout of what was important to you as you listened so that you can have places to go back to and to investigate um, as you as you pray through the, the treadmill. Okay, tonight I want, to t I want to cover three topics. The first topic is the principle and foundation, which is a contribution by St. Ignatius of Loyola to our understanding of the spiritual life. The second topic is silence, and the third topic is how you might pray. Um, the principle foundation uh, is, this is the reflection by St. Ignatius of Loyola. The human person is created to praise, revere, and serve God our Lord, and by doing so to save his or her soul. All other things on the face of the earth are created for human beings in order to help them pursue the end for which they are created. The end for which we are created is to know love and God, know love and serve God, and by that be saved. It follows from this that one must use other created things insofar as they help towards one's end, one's purpose and free oneself from them insofar as they are obstacles to one's end. To this matter, we need to make ourselves indifferent to all created things, provided the matter is subject to our free choice and there is no other prohibition. Thus, as far as we are concerned, we should not want wealth, we should not want health more than illness, wealth more than poverty, fame more than disgrace, or a long life more than a short one. And similarly, for all the rest, but we should desire and choose only what helps us move towards the end for which we were created. The famous, probably the most famous line from the Baltimore Catechism is a, it's like the third question. It's the one everybody learns to memorize is, why am I here? I'm here to know, love, and serve God in this life and to be with him forever in the next. That question is, why do I exist? What is the meaning of my life? When you have second graders who, for most of the history of the United States, were able to regurgitate the meaning of life from memory because it was pressed in on them. And now we have a society that is completely un like baffled. Why am I here? Why do I live? It was there in black and white, and we kind of just moved away from it. And it's not been very helpful for us to move away from understanding why do we exist? Now, there's a big old long philosophical reason why that's not in the forefront of our mind, and I'll save you from that for now. If you want to know more about that, we can talk about it later. 
But the reality is to get back to why do I exist? What is my purpose? In the series, in the, in the understanding of causes, one of the reasons why a thing exists is to meet a certain goal, a certain end. So why does the table exist? The table exists to hold things up. Why does a human being exist? A human being exists so that they may know, love, and serve God in this life and be with him forever in the next. And if that is our purpose, St. Ignatius Loyola says, whatever takes away from that, we ought to freely be able to do away with. Reflecting on Jesus Christ saying, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it is better for you to be thrown in, in, to enter heaven maimed than to be thrown into hell. And whatever helps us should be clung to. Now, the practical result of this is that Ignatian spirituality is frustratingly ambiguous. It means you ask a good Ignatian spiritual director, should I do this or that thing? They, their answer is never yes or no. Their answer is, well, if you think it'll help you then do it. And if you won't, which of course is not the answer you wanted because you wanted, you wanted guidance as to what you might do, not a suggestion for further prayer. You want him to do the work for you. That's the, that's why we ask that question. And Ignatius in the way that he guided people would always go, no, 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 no. I don't have the answers. God has the answers for you. So if it helps you in your prayer, do it. And if it doesn't help you in your prayer, don't do it. So that would be things like this. A lot of people will sometimes say, I love to listen to music when I pray. It really helps me pray. And that makes me nervous. Because for some people, music becomes an escape from reality. That I can live in this world of notes and, and pauses and silence and rhythm and lyrics and words. And it's very beautiful. But it's a beauty that I escape from my own reality with. It's a way for me to turn off my brain for a little while. Now, that's not to say that there are, have not been many, many, many artists who found God in the creation of their own art. Especially, I can think of those whose greatest contribution to Christianity has been their poetry or their music. Well, if that's the case, that music may have actually helped that person, or at least was the fruit of their prayer. But what we really must avoid is I'm just going to listen to Christian music and tell myself that I'm praying because I'm listening to Christian music. Okay. I prayed the office literally the hours many times in the seminary. Many, many, many times. And there were many morning prayers to which I was more a observer than a participant. Now, have I fulfilled the obligation that the church puts on me to pray morning prayer? Yes. Has that obligation actually changed my life? No. Because I was still sleepy, I hadn't woken up, or whatever. I didn't have my morning coffee or whatever. Whatever the reality was. And so, the, even though I was there and doing this thing that was good, it was not actually impacting me. Because of some hindrance that I provided. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the, the whole core of that is, is that we would constantly be aware of what is helping me and what is hindering me. What is becoming a distraction? So if the music is a distraction, then, then cut the music off. If reading is a distraction, where I'm not actually praying, I'm not actually interacting with God, but I'm just consuming, 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 it's not helping us, and we ought to let it go. And we need to look at this as both persons, places, things, ideas, activities, hobbies. Um, there are a great many people that would be benefited by having a real friend. And we lack real deep friendships. And that really hinders our capacity to really enjoy life. Because we don't have these deep friendships. What we do have is a great number of acquaintances. And some of them that are not very good. And we, I think most of us are aware of one or two friends that we really legitimately like. But they're not good for our soul. They're not good for our spiritual development. Now gen generally in that regard, that's probably because that person doesn't challenge us too much. And they're very entertaining to be around. But the goal of human life is not to be entertained.
is to get close to God. So you want to have those kinds of friendships that help you get close to God. Now, this is not to say that you take your whole triduum and reevaluate all of the things you own and all of the people you have relationships with and all of the ideas that you love and all the hobbies you have and go and, and categorize them according to what helps my relationship and what doesn't. And I'm going to eliminate all of these and dive more deeply into that. No, that would be another distraction and it's not going to help you. Now, Maybe during the course of the, of the weekend, some, God may, you, you, your heart may be drawn to one or two things that, oh, this is not really helping me. I, and that's a hard place to be because it's kind of one of these things where you sit down and go, I guess we have to get rid of it. And it's hard. Because just like it's hard to get rid of clutter in our houses, it's hard to get rid of clutter in our hearts. Even if, it's, even if that means, you know, imagine if you had to say goodbye to someone you've been friends with your whole life. And you're like, look, I'm sorry. I love you, but I don't want to go to hell because I keep hanging out with you. Not that you would ever say that to anybody. Please, never. No. But there may be people you, you have to say goodbye to. There may be hobbies, which is probably one of the bigger things, that you have to say goodbye to because this doesn't help my spiritual development. Now, to do that very deeply and to do that perfectly would take a lifelong commitment to purging our lives of the things that are not good for us. And take a deep breath. It's a lifelong thing. You don't have to have it perfect by tomorrow. Okay. Now, one of the most predominant things that distracts us and pulls us away from God is what I'm going to call noise. And the opposite of noise is silence. Now, what noise doesn't just mean is physical noise that bombards your, your, ear, your uh, eardrums and your brain registers as, in, as sound. That's not just what noise is. But noise is the sum total of all things that distracts us away from the kind of silence that allows us to contemplate. The simplest version of this is just silence. The, the actual physical silence of, of a quiet room. But that can also be, and probably more importantly, is the discipline, and it's a very real discipline, of shutting down our mind for a time. And that is not, not, because the room can be physically silent, but if your brain is still going 153 miles, 153 miles per hour, it's not helping you. And it's still going to be distracting. So first let's stop on why is silence good and why it's important. And, and, and then we can reflect on why noise is bad. So this is from Pope Benedict's papal audience on March 7th in 2012. The first, he's, he's listing out the reasons why silence is important for prayer. Uh, the first is the one that concerns the acceptance of the word of God. Inward and outward silence are necessary if we are to be able to hear this word. And in our time, this point is particularly difficult for us. In fact, ours is an error that does not encourage recollection. Indeed, one sometimes gets the impression that people are frightened of being cut off even for an instance from the torrent of words and images that mark and fill the day. There is also a second important connection between silence and prayer. Indeed, it is not only our silence that disposes us to listen to the word of God in our prayers. We often find we are confronted by God's silence. God doesn't talk to us. We feel as it were let down, it seems to us, that God neither listens nor responds. Yet God's silence, as happened to Jesus, does not indicate his absence. Christians know well the Lord is present and listens, even in the darkness of pain, rejection, and loneliness. Pope Benedict is reflecting on Jesus Christ on the cross and in the garden, where God seems absent. But he's not. It's not in God's nature to be absent from anywhere. Here's what silence does. Noise becomes an escape where we don't have to focus on things that make us uncomfortable. The problem is, is when we get silent, like if you want somebody to change, tell them, tell them what they're doing that is wrong and then never talk to them about it again. Because then they have to deal with it in their own interior life, in their heart. They have to deal with the very pesky voice of conscience, which is the part of our heart where we admit uh, she's right as much as we might not like it 
or, or he's right and I need to let go of this thing. So silence allows us to hear the voice of conscience, which is that very deep interior place where God speaks to us. So in the silence, God can point out thoughts, feelings, and desires that might guide us in other directions. Silence is a place where we encounter a reality outside of ourselves that can give direction and order to our reality. Silence is the place where we rest from the noise. Silence is the place where we can prepare to go back into the noise. Because the noise is where the battle is. The noise is where real people live. The monks and the nuns may live a life of complete and total interior and exterior silence. I guarantee you, actually, the more exterior silence a person has, more likely the more interior noise they have. And most people do not live in a place of exterior silence. I grew up in a household where we had the TV on all the time. All the time. Very little silence. But silence is where we hear God's voice. There's a famous passage from uh, the, the story of the book of Kings, the story of Elijah. He goes into the mountains and God says, I'll be passing by, wait for me. And Elijah hears the giant, uh, the, the wind that crushes the rocks and the rushing sound and the, the water and the fire. I'm probably getting this all wrong, but he stops and goes out at none of those, but the tiny whispering sound. And he needed the exterior and the interior silence to hear that. That's why I encourage silence for this week. Silence is a, uh, we, we live in a desert of silence. Just, there's, there's, there's no silence at all. You, you think of a, an elevator. We can't stand the awkwardness of being in a, in a space with other people and doing nothing. Although that's the core of deep spirituality, is that you get some time to do nothing. Pope Benedict says in another place, we ought not see time in prayer and time spent with God is time wasted, but it's time simply being in the presence of God, the one we love. So even if in our silence we, to the outside world, appear to be comatose and nothing is happening, it doesn't matter. I'm spending time with God, and more importantly, he is forming my interior, even if I don't see it. So that is why we want to move to silence. Um, the, the, only, the only last caveat on silence is that we, we really need to be careful because sometimes things that exterior look like noise, look like silence, or in fact, just a really, really creative reinvention of the noise. So uh, one of the examples that uh, a German th a theologian uses is that we go to pray and we think that by reading, we are praying. Now you can read and pray at the same time. That is not impossible. But don't confuse yourself in believing that by reading you are praying. No, praying is an active and mysteriously a passive activity all at the same time. And so you don't just passively pray by reading. You may, but that's not what you're, you're robbing yourself of something much deeper you can receive by actively praying aside from the other thing. Okay. Okay. Last page. Uh, two pages. Okay. What I want to do is give you guys the crash course in prayer. And I mean real crash course. Um, at least those of you from St. Genevieve remember we had the Institute for Priestly Formation came on and talked to us for a weekend. Um, when I was at the IPF for the summer, they before the eight-day silent retreat, we're doing this in three days, they, they made us do it for eight days. Before the eight-day silent retreat, they had three days of classes to cover all of this stuff. We're going to do it in 10 minutes. So buckle up. Here we go. The first and most – there are three different ways to pray that I'm introducing to you. There's actually a fourth now that I think about it, and I really want to talk about it because it's really important. Um, but there is a there – there's one thing that permeates all of this. And that is an attentiveness and an awareness of our interior reality that focuses on our effective movements. Now, that is a really fancy word for thoughts, feelings, and desires. And a lot of us will generally have one of those that's a little rusty. So I was not a big feeler in high school. And so when I went to do my hospital ministry and they really wanted to know, what did that make you feel? For about a month, I wanted to shout at our director until I realized I was writing my reports wrong. And what I needed to do was just stop and ask myself, how, okay, stop. 
How do you feel right now? And I would, I would, I had to, I had modified her directions. She loved it. You know, a standing ovation because I, I, I said, I can't do what you told me to do. I've got to do this my own way. And so I had to make a new column that said, how do I feel? And so that changed everything for me because I was rusty in the feeling department. Well, actually, probably in the design department as well. So what this goes into is the three major faculties of the human person. So we are an intellect, mind, our knowledge. We, are, we have a will, our desires, what we want, what we don't want. And we have passions, what we like and what we don't like. Those have corresponding realities that go on in our interior. Thoughts, that's what our intellect does. Feelings, that's what our passions, our emotions do. And desires, that's what our will does. You walk out of, one may walk out of a prayer experience and feel at peace or joyful or sad or depressed. I hope not, but that, that can happen. One might walk out of a prayer experience. Thomas Aquinas would do that. Actually, he, he was very weird. St. Thomas Aquinas, um, there's a famous story of he was invited to a dinner party and he was, he was talking with somebody and I believe he just stopped talking and like didn't say anything for like a minute and said, I've got an argument to beat the Albigensians, which is a, a heresy that, that you know, quote unquote, doesn't exist anymore. And... It, he didn't sit there and try and think about it. He was in this meal, probably had a hundred, he was so smart, he probably had several hundred things bouncing around the back of his head. And suddenly, this thought occurred to him that had not occurred to him previously, nor had he arrived at it by some kind of discursive knowledge, where he figured, you know, he's, you know one plus two plus three, you know, six, and figured it out. No, it just occurred to him. And th one might walk into prayer and walk out of prayer realizing, Oh my God, my understanding of God the Father is completely wrong. I remember when I was studying Trinity theology, actually the year after I was studying Trinitary theology, I'm driving home and I'm looking at the clouds, which I shouldn't have been doing because I was driving. And all of a sudden it dawned on me something I, I had missed about the way I understood this. And I just clearly saw, I may not understand anything about Trinitary theology, but I know this thing I believed is wrong. And all of a sudden, I saw something that I thought I had figured out clearly. And that, that, that little act of prayer brought a new thought to my mind. Now, I, I'm one that's more a thinker than a feeler or any of this other stuff. So that's the place where I tend to dwell and want to go when I'm at prayer. And that's the place where I have to stop myself from wanting to spend too much time because that's not where I'm going to find my holiness. I'm not going to have to worry about thinking in prayer. Why? Because that's what I'm drawn to. What I need to worry about is the other two things. Okay? One might walk out of a prayer experience and go, I need to go on a mission trip. I, I, I want to do something for, uh, I want to volunteer at church or school or something like that. Where all of a sudden this new desire that did not exist before that now exists in my heart. A famous story of a, a young man who was, uh, or St. Francis of Assisi, walks into a church very comfortable and satisfied in himself, in himself and hears the gospel. You go sell everything that you own and follow me. And it just washes over him like Jesus Christ saying it to him specifically. And he walks out of that church with the desire to give away all that he owns. And he was very rich. And he did. Famously leaving even his clothes behind. That, that he was going to be so detached from the world. So that our, when we go to pray, we ought to pay attention to those little interior movements of our hearts. Because most prayer is not the clouds opening up and the voice coming from the heavens. Because God's smart enough to know that that would freak us out. And it, it wouldn't work. So instead, he often just moves in those quiet interior places. Our thoughts, our feelings, and our desires. And we're going to see how all of this wraps together in the practice of prayer. Okay, so the first and oldest form of prayer is Lexio Divina, which is the famous Latin word, uh, famous, uh, fancy Latin word for divine or sacred reading. The purpose of Lexio Divina is that you are going to apply a systematic process of reading in order to experience your prayer. The first step in Lexio is that of reading. You pick a passage, actually, the step zero is you pick a passage on which you want to pray. You read it, and then you read it again, and then you read it a third time. 
And then maybe on the third or fourth time, you read it with careful focus and attention. You're applying your intellect. You are looking at the different characters and paying attention to small details. Then after you've read it multiple times, you would move on to meditation. Now you are going to think about what happened in the passage. What does it mean? What is this? How does this relate to other passages in sacred scripture? How does this relate to my life? Ultimately, all of that reflection is going to lead you to a place, um, if you're attentive, on something that you want to pray about. You may realize in that prayer, I'm, this person is very grateful. I am not that grateful. I need more gratitude. Okay, I, this person is very grateful. That's a thought. I'm not very grateful. That's another thought. I need to be more grateful. That is a desire. And the dissatisfaction that comes with that is an emotion. Is a feeling. So you're paying attention to all of that. One might go, Lord, help me to be more thankful. Now that may not be the best prayer because God is going to give you opportunities to be grateful, um, which can work one of two ways. Either he showers blessings on you in hopes that you might develop gratitude because of the great blessings you've been given, or he might take stuff away from you such that you learn to be more grateful for the things you already have. Um, you would walk away and you'd have that prayer. So you pray that prayer. Lord, I want more gratitude. Listening afterwards. So contemplation, the third step, is when we would listen. I'm sorry, fourth step. Is when we would listen to what God says in response to our prayer. Now that's going to work in these small thoughts, feelings, and desires. What do you feel God is saying to you? It also may not always be clear. And you may not always, quote unquote, get something. What's, not, what's important is that you've spent the time with God and that you've listened. Because sometimes, God, maybe God doesn't speak because you don't need to hear anything. You've already got everything you need. And so he's just, go do it. Sometimes the, the reason God doesn't say anything is so that we would yearn more for him. Sometimes he speaks to us. That's easy. You just respond to that as best it goes. And so then um, you, you might take this moment after, if you hear him say something, you have a thought, you have a feeling, something just ooh, catches you. You might want to go back to meditating on that. Now think about that and then pray about that and then listen again. And if not, look, you get to the end of it and there's nothing more or there's nothing coming. It's fine. Don't beat yourself up. Go back and reread the passage. Read it twice. Maybe, and you'll be surprised after you've meditated on a, after you've read a passage multiple times and then meditated on it and prayed about it, how much more you can see when you go read it the second time. So long as you're not just reciting it from memory, but actually looking at the words. This accomplishes two things. Number one, you get to interact with God. You know, that is the primary goal. A secondary effect of this is you read the same passage like 8, 12 times, you're going to start to memorize that passage. And so now the very words of God in sacred scripture are inscribed in your mind. And he can then use that later on in another experience of prayer to speak with you. Now, you'll notice I have a second name next to Lexio Divina, and you've got to understand the story behind that. If you've never eaten a Slim Jim... Don't. They're terrible for you. But if you want to fully experience this, go eat a Slim Jim. The funny thing is you can chew a Slim Jim to the point that you can swallow it, and you haven't really extracted all of that wonderful, smoky, salty, greasy goodness. And so if you watch kids eat Slim Jims, often they'll take a bite, and they'll just sit there and chew it like chewing tobacco. And what they're doing is they can still taste there's more flavor in there, and they'll keep chewing it, keep chewing it, keep chewing it. An ancient image for understanding Lexio Divina is to look at the way like an animal might chew roughage. You know, often the human being, we, you know, I have a friend who had to be told by somebody else, I think your stomach hurts you so much because you don't chew when you eat. And he was just eating so fast that he'd been on actually chewing the food. And the, the process of chewing actually breaks open the food and gives us nutrients. So 
what one of the early church fathers said about prayer and reading sacred scripture is that it is like trying to get food in your body. The reading is the putting the food into your mouth. The meditating is the chewing. The contemplating is savoring it. And con I'm not sorry. The prayer is savoring it. And the contemplation is being nourished by it. So that you, the whole purpose of this is to repeat it. It's going to seem repetitive, but that's okay. Because the purpose was not to get done or to get finished or to get something, but to spend time with the, the, very, uh, the very scripture that God has put in front of you. All right. So that's Lexio Divina. Imaginative prayer is the invention, not invention, uh, innovation of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, he was a very creative and imaginative person. He was a very romantic person. Um, so it, it makes a whole lot of sense that this is the prayer he came up with. Um, it works very similar to Lexio Divina, that you would find an image, um, that you would find an event in, in, the, in the history of sacred scripture or in, in sacred history that you were going to spend some time with. So um, the one that I think was always most profound for me, um, I don't know why, is the calling of Matthew the tax collector. It is just the one thing that I can very vividly imagine. And I can put myself in the, uh, you know, the adobo room with the thatched roof and this guy sitting behind a table just ticking off his numbers because Matthew was the chief tax collector. Uh, no, he wasn't. I'm sorry. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And all of a sudden somebody walks in and he hears him and he goes, okay, next. And he never looks up. And then Jesus says, Matthew, calls him by name. Come and follow me. And the reason why this passage sticks out to me is because I can, I, I've been in Israel before, but that, that didn't, I, I had this prayer before that. I, like, I can feel the desert, the heat, the sand, the dryness. For some reason, I want to make it Grand Isle, but my brain is weird like that. But I can really feel this place. Ignatius is saying, go there. Imagination is one of the most powerful tools that, we, that God has given us and is the source of our creativity. Go there in your imagination and see what happens. Listen, let it play out in your mind. Go back, read the passage over and over again. And then just like the Met Lexio, you'd, you'd meditate on it, then you'd pray about it, and then you'd listen to God. You'd contemplate afterwards. Then you go back. And maybe the second time you're reviewing the story, which character calls out to me? Who am I in this story? And sometimes you'll be surprised. Because you take the story of the prodigal son. Well, there's a lot of people you can be in the prodigal son. You can be the prodigal son. You can be the father. You can be the unhappy son that stayed behind. You can be the servant that's like, bro, I just work here. Your father did that, not me. You can be that guy. You can be the other guy who was just watching. And, or you could be a fly on the wall in that story. Or you can be one of the partiers. There's a lot of characters that you could slip into. And it's very interesting to watch. Who do I relate with? And then maybe after that, okay, who do I not relate with? Because that actually may be where more fruit lies. Because, you know, even though I may relate more with the prodigal son because I recognize my faults and failures, maybe I've been a, Bapt I've been a cradle Catholic my whole life. And I look down on people who are not Christians, but I don't want to admit that to myself. And so I'm really the older brother. Or maybe, just maybe, I have some important responsibilities over people that are younger than me. And they need to learn from me. And they need my compassion, love, and care. And the person God is really trying to form us into is not the younger brother or the older brother, but the father. And to offer that same love and forgiveness to those that we put before us. So to look at those characters and say, who, who, do I, who am I in this story? The last way is, is pretty new. It's called relational prayer. This comes out of the Institute for Priestly Formation. Um, the easy way to remember this is A-R-R-R. -R -R. It's an A and three R's. Um, so we lovingly refer to it as pirate prayer. R. Okay. What that means is you acknowledge, relate, receive, and respond. Um, this is a this is actually the process by which one talks with a friend. Um, you're not a very good friend if you don't acknowledge what your friend says to you. But just like you would acknowledge somebody's talking, I remember this very vivid image of this day. 
I, uh, it was when I was assigned to St. Bernadette, I went to go get coffee in the morning and I'm pouring the coffee into my coffee cup and I'm not awake. I'm a, I'm a walking zombie at this point. And I'll, I'm about halfway through filling the coffee cup and I realize the person next to me is talking to me. And actually has been for quite some time. And I'm just <laughs> oblivious to the world around me. So I put the coffee pot back and I look and I go, I'm sorry, I missed all of that. Could you repeat it again? No, I didn't acknowledge what she, what this person was saying to me beforehand, but I, at least I acknowledged I wasn't paying attention. So I was able to relate that to her, so our uh, housekeeper and cook. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not you. It really is me. I'm just, I'm dead to the world right now. Retell me everything you just said. So then I could at that point receive her response to me and what she actually said the first time. And then I could again respond with knowledge. And that response becomes a new acknowledgement because whatever I receive from that person, whatever I respond with, starts this process over again. I acknowledge what you said to me, I receive it, I process it in my brain, however long that takes. Then I respond to you and it starts the communication process. So the way this works in prayer is the person we're talking to is God or Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit, or God the Father, or um, or maybe you're praying with one of the saints and you're asking for their intercession. You know, it's not the same adoration that you would give God, but uh, it is a similar process. And I, I acknowledge what's going on in my life. Maybe it's something very simple, maybe it's something very complicated. You know, the day a person gets fired from their job, like if they're not praying about that being fired, okay, maybe, maybe that day is not the best day to do it, but the next day or whatever, if they're not gonna pray about that, I don't know what they're praying about. If we're not gonna pray about with the thing that's actually causing us the most stress, we're wasting our time with God because often that's what he wants to talk about. And this is not wasting the time like Pope, France, Pope Benedict was talking about. We're like, I'm going to talk to God and nothing's happening. This is, I'm going to talk to God and I'm not even open to where he's leading me. Acknowledging what's going on in my heart. Maybe I'm angry. Maybe I'm disappointed. Maybe I want more from life. Maybe I'm confused. I don't understand this whole Paschal Triduum thing. Every time Father Alex talks, that my eyes glaze over. I don't understand anything he's saying. Whatever it is. I'm acknowledging that. I'm not making a judgment about it. I'm just acknowledging it. And then what we go to do is, instead of making a judgment in our own head and trying to fix the problems... I relate that to God. So if I'm angry, I'll, I'll be angry with God. Let him know I'm angry. Maybe that anger looks different for other people. You know, Somebody cut me off in traffic. Man, that... Maybe I'm angry with a coworker. Maybe I'm disappointed with my son or daughter or spouse or whatever it is. Start there. Maybe I'm tired because every time I go to pray, God doesn't talk back to me. Or every time I go to pray, God asks me to do something I'm afraid to do. That's cool. Anything works. Whatever is really going on in your heart, whatever your reality is, that is what you want to pray about. So acknowledge what's going on in your heart. Then, after relating that to God, you listen to his... I'm sorry. Then you relate that to God. So you, you actually tell him, like, look, I am... Like, like, he's right there. Like, sitting in this chair right here. Jesus Christ is going to talk to me. He's my padna. I'm really mad because Father Eric keeps eating all of my brownies. And it's driving me nuts. That's not happening. Please don't drop me off any brownies. Maybe I'm disappointed. Maybe I've just read a sacred scripture and I realize God is asking me to make a big change in my life. And I'm going to really relate that to God. I'm afraid. I don't, I don't want to do this. Like nothing is off limits. Talk to him as if he was in that chair. Because actually technically God is omnipresent. So he is in this chair. But he is also everywhere else. So talk to God. Right there. That's why it's sometimes powerful to have a place to pray in your house where you have an image of Jesus. So that you can, I'm not actually imagining the person Jesus standing there. I'm looking at an image of him. And that it, it's less of a jump to get to that space where, where he's going to talk to me. Okay. Now, receiving is just like contemplating in the other two forms of prayer. What am I hearing back? What sticks out to me? What's new? What thoughts, feelings? Maybe it's the same thing. Maybe I'm still angry. Or maybe I'm not getting it. Or maybe I feel God is very far away. 
Um, every experience of prayer is different. We're not looking for an answer. We're not looking to get something. But we're listening because if God is talking, and he probably is, I want to hear what he's saying to me. So we try and receive from him. Now, the response is, it can be a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's a new cycle of acknowledgement and really receiving and res responding and receiving. Um, sometimes that response really ought to be, you know, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for giving me this. Um, or maybe we fight back. Maybe we, um, and, and it's, it's not wrong to fight back with God, but you got to follow it through. So mo both Moses and Abraham bargained with God. And so it's, it's not wrong to say to God, look, I don't want to sell everything I own and move to Kenya and work with the poor. That terrifies me. And, you know, to talk back to, to God about that. Now, often, I think that might actually play out where God's like, wait, whoa, 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 where'd you get that from? I'm not telling you to do that. No, you can't do that. You have a family you have to take care of and a job that you, that, that, no, don't do that. That's, that, that's not good at all. A lot of times we presume we already know what God's answer is. And the real simple practical stuff is the stuff that God is calling us to. You know, sometimes these people, people will come up to me and they'll talk about, I don't know what God's will for my life is. And I'll say, what do you want to do? They say, I want to do what God's will is. I know that. That's not the question I asked you. What do you want to do? Don't ignore your desire. God put that in your heart. Another thing is, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Okay. Cool. I can tell you one thing, God, two things God wants you to do. Number one, don't kill people. That goes, you know, all the other Ten Commandments fall under that, but um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the easiest one for us to grasp. Like, you know how you know that's God's will for our life? Because he told us not to do it in the Ten Commandments. The second one is that we understand through the Second Vatican Council and through Sacred Scripture that God calls all to holiness and to love. So without fail, whatever God is calling to you in your life, whatever, however messy or neat or clean or whatever, God is calling us to love. And at the bare minimum, if we do nothing else, that will get us to heaven. And we don't have to... A, a lot of people think God's will for our life is mysterious. And a lot of times it's not. What are your gifts? What are your talents? What do you enjoy? I guarantee you, God doesn't want you to go into a career where you're just miserable every day. Even though our, our generation seems to be quite welcome, quite open to doing that, which doesn't make any sense at all. You stay with the same thing, the same repetition, until either there's either your hour is your your half hour or you're out, please do not go beyond an hour. Uh, until your time is up, or I feel like I beat this, like it's done. Just like if you, there's a certain point when you're eating the beef jerky, when you're eating the Slim Jim, where you just got to swallow it and go on for the, either go for the next bite, bite or throw the wrapper away. And so when you get to that point, that was when you just, you'd go on to the next thing. Okay. And if there's nothing to go on to dive into sacred scripture. There was a lot of times in the seminary where my habit of prayer was start with relational prayer. And then whenever I had worked through, and sometimes never get to sacred scripture. Because seminary is hard and people, you live with 80 other guys, well, 120 other guys and the, half of them drive you nuts and the, the other half of them you, wanna, you don't want anything to do with anyway. And you got a lot of stuff to talk with God about. And sometimes you just stay in the relation. Sometimes you move to, sometimes you, you look back at what you, what you did last time and you say, man, I feel like that's all done. And you, you don't do any relational thing because... Because there's nothing in my heart that I really need to... I'm looking and there's, there's nothing to talk about. Okay, well, there's nothing to talk about. Then we don't need to sit here and pretend to, to make stuff up. No, it's, that's grasping at i got to make something happen. No, go on to sacred scripture. Because I guarantee you, Jesus Christ wants to say something to you through the sacred scriptures. Okay. Just as a... Oh, the, the fourth note. Um, a, a fourth way to pray, a more traditional Catholic way of prayer, is by way of the rosary. What I don't mean is the 15-minute speed run through uh, your five uh, mysteries, but to actually spend a good five or ten minutes with each mystery um, so that you, you, you do use the whole, so that the, the prayer beads become what you go to when you get distracted. 
or you or would you go to when there's nothing else left in the in the mystery uh, imagine how different our lives would be if every day i spent five minutes meditating on i spent 30 minutes meditating on five different mysteries from the life of christ so that's the proper way to pray the rosary and that is that is an excellent way you're doing all this stuff it's just instead of sacred scripture it's the mysteries of the road and uh, one last note is that um, prayer is not uh, perfect it's not a science it's not an art uh, what that means is is it be ready for it to not to be messy you don't have to get something you you it may be just be silence that's fine you're there to talk with God, not to dominate the conversation with God. Let, if, if, if he says we just want to sit here in silence today, then sit there in silence. That's fine. What might be helpful for you is um, after one moment, time of prayer, if something was very powerful or really spoke to you, then the next time you go to pray, start there. Because God may not be done speaking to you there. Another thing that's very powerful is to take a notebook with you. And at the end of your prayer time, um, to say, to write in that notebook and say, okay, what did I experience? What were my thoughts? What were my feelings? What were my desires? Did I feel like I had a good experience? Did I feel like I had a bad experience? What do I need to pray about next time? Uh, what does this experience of prayer tell me I need to do? Because if, uh, if your experience of prayer very clearly says I need to get the TV out of my bedroom, you don't want to forget that. Also, it becomes a powerful place to eliminate distraction. Especially, like, I, I know me, I tended to be distracted by things I didn't want to forget. And so I just write the note in my journal and go on. And, like, it was, it was no longer a distraction because I didn't have to worry about forgetting it. It was written in the journal. Okay. That is the crash course on prayer. It's about twice as long as what I intended it to be, but hey, man, that's what it is. Um, let's shift here. And move to, do you guys have any questions, comments, funny stories, refutations? I know it's kind of like drinking from the fire hose. I thought it was all good. Yeah, I definitely needed the silence talk. Man, that's just so hard to get away from noise, especially interior noise. Because all during the day, like, I'm in contact hundreds and hundreds of kids, phone calls, just the halls, and so it's like at some point during the day, your brain has to sift through that, you know, and it, so even when I, I, I find though I've been reading way too much, it's like I can't get enough of the next thing out, and maybe I'm missing it, somebody said it better than me, and you know, whether it's Matthew Kelly or whoever, and so I need to stop bringing stuff with me to the chapel. Yeah, I think we really underestimate how much you can accomplish um, reading for 10 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the, the thing is to not stop reading. It's just don't right. read in your chapel time. Right, and, and count that as prayer. Yeah. Right, it's not prayer. Anything else? Go on once. Go on twice. So... Okay, next time, um, by show of hands, who's coming for 3 or 3.15 tomorrow? Oh, okay, I'm going to try, boring, boring any crisis. <laughs> I think everybody's going to flee. Yeah, 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 yeah. If my it boss is, will let me go. It is, <laughs> it is the last day before, the, uh, before uh, the Easter break. Okay, that being the case, um, my, my certainly uh, take this time tonight to plan out not like in not like in super detail that you have to like know every second of the day what you're going to be doing but if you don't know when you're going to do your 30 minutes of prayer tomorrow you may not so you know have that have that planned uh, if you don't know where you're going to go to the mass of the lord's supper tomorrow you, you may not go so go go look most of the um mass times for the different parishes are available on their websites or in their bulletins or you can call them tomorrow during the day and find or in the morning and find out when when they're having um their easter schedule um and let's pray for each other 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen.